So thank you again for uh, taking time to join me this evening as we work our way through some proposed housing amendments. My name, for those of you who don't know me, is Gail Henriksen, and I am the county's community development director. And uh, we're here tonight really to talk about some changes that the board uh, may consider. And to give you a little bit of background and perspective, um, we all know that uh, not only the state of Oregon, but the entire nation is facing a lot of issues with housing. Uh, there simply is not enough housing to take care of the needs of everyone, especially some of our most vulnerable po populations. Uh, we know that Governor Kotek, uh, early last year as part of her emergency orders ha wants to achieve the goal of constructing 36,000 housing units a year, which is an incredible amount. And of course, not all of them will be built here in Clatsop County, um, but throughout the state. Um, as part of this, our board of commissioners has uh, made a, re a very strong commitment to uh, the housing needs within Clatsop County. Uh, they've been working on this since 2021 when they started uh, their strategic plan and made housing a priority in that plan. And that has continued through to this day. Uh, we know that we have spent a lot of our ARPA money on um, homeless uh, issues and partnering with other agencies to provide shelter beds and transitional housing and then pulling together that multi-agency coordination group, the MAC group that uh, has received over $4 million from the state to address some of those housing issues as well. And so this proposed project is really a continuation of the board's efforts. Uh, this is uh, a direction from the board to for staff to really look at our internal codes and see where there are options and opportunities to make some changes to help uh, facilitate housing construction at all points. So while we've really been focused as a county on taking care of the most immediate and vulnerable populations, uh, we're trying to expand now and move on. Uh, we also know that uh, coming up in the next few years, the Oregon housing needs analysis is going to start um, looking at housing needs, uh, identifying the lack and what the quota will be in different jurisdictions. We also know that by July 1st of 2025, that uh, we will have to adopt clear and objective standards when it comes to housing. And so that project, which is on a different track, uh, has already been started and we have been working with our planning commission on that. And we will be giving a presentation to the board of commissioners, I believe on February 14th, uh, sometime in February to uh, give them an update on the project as well. So uh, before we go any further, I just want to stop for a second. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I don't know if anybody has any questions immediately before I go any further. Okay, so seeing none, I'm going to keep going, go back and share my screen. Uh, just so you know, uh, for tonight's format, there's no sign up to ask questions. It'll just be uh, for those of you who may not have used Zoom somehow and missed that over the past four or five years. At the bottom of your screen, there is a little button that says reactions. And if you click on that, you'll see the raise hand function. Um, otherwise, if you do have questions, please feel free to um, uh, you know, interrupt me as I'm speaking. And we'll also have some question and answer time at the end as well, so. Okay, so as part of the work that staff presented to, well, let me back up first. Um, so when we talk about housing and what may impact housing, it's not just land use codes. I know everybody likes to look at planning and point the finger and say, you know, if planning would only change their ways, the world would be a better place. Um, and, you know, obviously we have a role to play as planning staff in uh, how housing gets produced uh, across the county. But there are a lot of other things that are outside of our control, uh, things like land availability and cost, uh, availability of construction materials. And we saw that very 
early in the pandemic when uh, the sheet of plywood prices skyrocketed, or if you could even find plywood. Uh, we know that infrastructure availability is a huge issue that really limits uh, housing production. Uh, we know that you know, requirements of building codes add costs to housing. System development charges for your schools, your water, your parks, your streets, uh, things like inflation and interest rates, and you know how much does the local uh, workforce make? You know what can they afford versus what's being built? Um, sometimes NIMBYism, people who are concerned or afraid or opposed to new housing or different housing types that may uh, stall or delay or even eventually kill a project. And of course, litigation that goes along with development. So all of, all of those things are really outside the control of community development and planning, but they do affect housing price as well. So what we are trying to do with these amendments is to streamline our processes as much as possible. So looking at reducing application fees, trying to reduce the amount of time it takes for someone to get an approval to build something. Um, overall, just make the process easier for people to understand and work through. Um, and then also trying to encourage construction of housing at all the different price points that we're looking at. So some of the things that we cannot do, even though um, you know we we try to be as helpful as we can here in community development, but you know we can't change the state's building codes. Uh, we can't change ORS. We have a lobbyist, but you know we are one voice among many when it comes to the state legislature. Uh, we can't even if we change all of our rules and make everything as simple as possible. We can't force anybody to develop their land, partition their land, sell their land. So those are still individual choices that the homeowner retains or a property owner retains. Um, also, we cannot reduce or waive system development charges. Uh, the county itself does not have any. We collect the school tax for the Astoria School District, but those development charges can't be waived. Somebody would have to pay them if, if we had them. So, you know, if if the county or an entity wanted to say, um, you know, we we using some funding source will pay the system development charges to help reduce the cost of housing, that could be done. But we couldn't just say, well, we, we you don't have to pay them anymore. So, and then um, I I wanted to do a little uh, discussion about rural communities versus rural residential. Uh, because I've been hearing some discussion and I, I want to make sure that we're using the, the same terms and understanding what they mean, because they do have uh, very different meanings when it comes to the statewide land use planning program. So rural community are, um, are areas that are more densely developed and have a different development pattern than rural residential. Um, rural residential is required by state statute to be uh, new parcels are required to be a minimum of two acres. And if you, um, let me kind of back up there, minimum of two acres, they are usually in an area where the county has taken an exception to goal three, which are agricultural lands, or goal four, which are forest lands. And um, for those not familiar with how this goal exception process works, what a jurisdiction is saying by taking a goal exception is that uh, that particular goal shouldn't apply because either the land is uh, irrevocably committed and developed uh, or there is another reason why that particular goal should not apply to this particular area. So when the county originally adopted its comprehensive plan in 1980, there were areas that were rural service areas that already po probably had water and uh, sewer services that uh, had much smaller uh, lot sizes and development patterns. And then there were areas that were developed, um, but not at the urban level. And so they became separated out and they're actually designated differently in our comprehensive plan. So, um, the rural service areas in 1980 were designated as development. The rural residential areas were designated as rural lands and they remain that way to this day. That's not changed over 44 years. 
Um, in 2003, the county, as part of periodic review, which is what used to be required to review and update your comprehensive plan, during periodic review, the county in uh, designated five rural communities. So these were already rural service areas in 1980. In 2003, the county came back and using the process outlined in Oregon Administrative Rules uh, 660 Division 22, they designated Arch Cape, Miles Crossing, Jeffers Gardens, Napa, Swenson, and Westport as rural communities. And uh, that remains in place again to this day. And uh, per Oregon Administrative Rules, OAR, uh, county plans and land use regulations are allowed to authorize any residential use and density in unincorporated communities. So um, however the board continues to move forward with any of these proposed changes, there is um, explicit authorization under state administrative rules that um, the county is within its legal parameters to even consider these uh, possibilities. Looking at the rural residential, these are things like your residential agriculture one, two, five zones. Uh, Cove Beach, which is coastal residential, is also considered rural residential, so it is different from Arch Cape in that it is not a rural community. Um, and again, that two acre minimum parcel size applies. And uh, just as a note, in uh, also in 2003, as part of that periodic review, uh, the county took a goal 14 exception. Goal 14 deals with urbanization and how you develop land and at what levels and when and how you can develop at more intense urban levels. And so we did that specifically uh, for Cove Beach, Arcadia Beach, and some areas in the Clatsop Plains because there was a development pattern there that was less than two acres. And uh, because of some legislation in 2000, that rule kicked in and required the two acre lot size. So in order to keep those smaller lot sizes in those three areas, this county had to take a goal 14 exception. So that was a lot of information. So I'm gonna stop again and see if anybody has any questions. Um, I can show you the pictures first in case you wanna think of some questions while I'm showing you pictures. So um, because pictures are worth a thousand words, I wanted to kind of put together some aerials that people could see. So again, uh, Swenson is a rural community. Arch Cape is a rural community. You can see the development pattern. You can see the road system. You can see the proximity of the houses to each other. And then this is rural residential. And it's harder to get an aerial photo because usually there are a lot more trees. Uh, but there is an area along Highway 26 uh, just east of the junction where there are um, some rural residential zones. Uh, and then on the right, you'll see Hamlet uh, off of Highway 53, which is also designated rural residential. Um, there's uh, less of a road system. The houses are further apart. The lots are larger uh, because they have a different designated development pattern. Okay, so before I go into the changes again, does anybody have any questions for me about the difference between rural communities and rural residential? Nope. Okay, all right, so then um, let's work through the proposed uh, changes. So one of the changes was to uh, allow duplexes as a type one use. And the county has several different processes that you can use to um, approve an application. Type one is um, the most objective. There is little discretion involved in that decision making. It is almost always an over-the-counter permit and typically uh, has a retail value of $85. So we would uh, propose taking duplex units, which oftentimes are a type two use, meaning it's a conditional use, it goes out for a public notice, sometimes depending on um, the area or the comments received, it could even go up to a public hearing. And uh, the fee for that is $1,200 because typically there's a lot more staff time involved in that, there's postage and uh, things like that that go along with it. 
So we um, would propose or have proposed that one change that could be considered would be to drop that down to um, a type one and eliminate the public notice for that. Any questions or comments about that one? Uh, change two. Uh, is to try and create uniformity across all of our different zones. And the example I pulled was one that we, um, a year or two ago, had um, some real world experience with. And so it's not that I'm picking on Arch Cape, it's that this was the, the um, example that was probably the most prominent and most recent that uh, came to mind. So uh, in, in Arch Cape, in the Arch Cape Rural Community Residential Zone, uh, the construction of new public or private roads has to go through that conditional use process. So there is public notice, there is a um, 21-day appeal period, and um, it's the only zone in the county where that's a requirement. Uh, any other place in the county, uh, you can do that as basically an $85 over-the-counter development permit or as part of partitioning your property or subdividing your property. And so uh, again, to try and make the process as efficient and cost-effective as possible, uh, staff has uh, offered the opportunity to change that from a conditional use down to the development permit. And I see we have a chat here. So I, uh, Nadia Gardner has posted a chat comment. Um, would it be possible to prohibit STRs in any new duplex, triplex, et cetera, like was done with ADUs? Uh, ADUs are accessory dwelling units. And when the state legislature passed um, some laws last year to allow that in the rural residential lands, they did expressly prohibit ADUs from being used as short-term rentals. So uh, not having consulted with County Council, Nadia, but I would suspect that it would also be possible to do that as well if you were to have uh, duplexes, triplexes, et cetera. Um, but again, that would be subject to County Council verifying my non-lawyerly assertion. Okay. All right, so any comments or questions about number two? Okay, so I know that one of the concerns um, that was raised when we went through this uh, example with in Arch Cape a couple of years ago was that uh, there are a lot of plats in, maybe not a lot, but there are a few plats in Arch Cape uh, done in the late 1800s, early 1900s, 1920s, that were basically, grid patterns with 50 foot lots laid out uh, without any consideration of geography. And I know that um, that has been a concern. We, this is not an uncommon situation. So, and I wanted to give some examples. So Prospect Park originally uh, recorded subdivision plat from 1890. This is over off of Young's River Road in the Lewis and Clark planning area. And what I've done is I've overlaid where the existing subdivision plat still exists. This is how it was platted, 50 foot lots. And the, this is uh, the LIDAR and you can see kind of the slopes and the contours of the land there. And you can't see me pointing at my screen with my finger, but it's very important that you see where I'm pointing. Um, this is Rosedale edition. This is out off of Lewis and Clark Road as well, uh, planted in 1897. Uh, Pacific edition, which is uh, right along Pipeline Road, which is uh, just to the east and south of Astoria, and also leads up to their water area, their, their water storage areas, uh, planted in 1890. That's particularly steep out there as well. That that plat's still in place. Um, and then another example I found was Demence Edition or Demence Edition, and that was done in 1889. And this is off of Highway 30 out by Scandinavian Cannery Road as you're uh, heading east on 30 out towards Portland. Okay, so proposed change number three uh, would be uh, 
for the board to consider reducing minimum required lot sizes. And so in our development zones, in our rural communities, uh, where there's often uh, sewer and almost and always water, we currently have a 10,000 square foot size for um, duplexes. We have a 7,500 square foot lot size for single family homes. And so staff uh, has put out the option that that could potentially be reduced to 5,000 square feet for single family homes, which would basically be a 50 by 100 lot and uh, consider reducing it down to 10,000 square feet for duplexes. Uh, let's see. Uh, Thomas Rado or Rado uh, has asked whether there are any duplexes or triplexes in Arch Cape currently. Um, there is a property that has a accessory dwelling unit on it, on, and I believe it's on Pacific Road. It's not an attached duplex, but a duplex doesn't necessarily have to be attached. Uh, if duplex is basically, you could have a detached duplex, which is basically two units on the property. So I know that there is one. Um, I didn't do a thorough survey though to see if there were any others. I can tell you that in the six years that I have been here, nobody has ever come in for a duplex permit ever. So, um, oh, and I see that Jay is answering my questions. So thank you, Jay. All right, um, so carrying on, So change number four um, would be to consider allowing triplex and quadruplex de um, dwellings in these development areas. So again, areas that have water, that have sewer, and that are already designated in the comprehensive plan as areas that um, have a development pattern that is more urban than you would find in uh, other parts of the county. So the development, residential development zones would include the Arch Cape area. Uh, it includes rural community multifamily residential, rural community single family residential, uh, rural service area multifamily and rural service area single family. And even though it doesn't apply to us, um, or we weren't required as a county to undertake this, but in 2019, House Bill 2001 began a process of addressing what's called missing middle housing. So allowing duplexes, triplexes, and quadplexes in areas that have traditionally been zoned for single family residential. So it's a proposal that is not mandated that the county do, but it is something that um, is not um, something that hasn't ever been done or tried before in the state of Oregon. So there are precedents for it. Um, again, these are things that the board the staff has put out for the board to consider. They're gonna to listen to your input and then um, you know, give direct direction back to staff. Right now, triplexes and quadplexes aren't allowed in these uh, single family zoning districts. And so new development standards would have to uh, be created to handle those. So things like lot sizes, uh, an approval process, and most likely since you would be going from what is basically now a single family that may allow duplexes and increasing the density. Uh, the board might want to consider a lot having triplexes and quadruplexes as a conditional use so that there is that public comment period and that there is that additional community involvement in the process. So any questions on number four? Okay, seeing none. Um, and I then a question. So yeah. with, with those larger buildings, you'll often get a lot more storm water coming off of the roof. What, how would you make sure that that storm water was staying on a lot when it was such a large building on a significantly smaller lot size? Yeah, so there is, I believe, language already in the Arch Cape Rural Community Zone that requires new development or additional development that increases something by 25% or more, they have to undergo a stormwater review and that goes through our county engineer. Okay. 
Marshall. Did that address your question, Nadia? Oh, um, yeah, it, you answered my question. I don't think that that, I, you know, in my experience, it hasn't been adequate with the current standard. So I can't imagine, say, a quadplex on a 100 by 100 lot being able to keep that water on site. We get 100 to 120 inches of rain a year here. So that if the board wants to move forward with uh, triplex and quadplexes, then again, we are develop we would be developing the standards for those. And that could be something that would also have to be looked at then if the uh, current standards aren't uh, working. Any other questions about number four? Okay. Yes, I added a question to the chat. Okay, just a sec. Uh, so right now, so the question is, uh, when will the stormwater review be completed? So right now, the, there isn't a review underway. We are um, working through these list of proposed changes. Uh, we're doing our community input session tonight, and then we will be going back to the board with your feedback um, and to see what the board would like to direct staff to do. So if the board does come back and direct staff to move forward with quad, quadplexes and triplexes, then we would have to create new roles to go into our zoning code. And so that process hasn't been started just because we don't know what the board's direction will be at this point. Um, but if, it, if we do move forward, there's gonna be a public hearing at the planning commission. Uh, there most likely would be a work session with the planning commission, a work session with the board and two public hearings with the board to adopt the final ordinance. So additional opportunities for public input as well. And I hope that answered your question. Thank you. I'm actually the question up above that. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. Can I address it? Okay. So, Erica, your question is, does this mean that an RA2 lot that has over 5,000 square feet but isn't quite two acres could build a single family residence? For board approval of the proposed amendments, on my understanding. So right now, if you have an RA2 lot, an RA2 means residential agriculture, two acre minimum lot size. If it was legally created before that two acre requirement went into effect, then you could um, you could build a house on there. And right now you can also build an accessory dwelling unit on there. There are some requirements you have to meet, but it, um, actually I take that back. You're, to build an accessory dwelling unit in RA2, you'd have to have a minimum of two acres. Um, and so that that doesn't need new board approval. That's already in our code. Uh, so there, these amendments would not affect that. And did I answer your question, Erica? Uh, yes, thank you. That was just in refer. Uh, that was actually referencing slide. Um, I believe the points one and two that you were talking about. Just when you were discussing minimum, minimum. Okay. Yeah. So the minimum lot size would not change for RA two. Um, simply because that's set by state statute and we we aren't able to change it that minimum two acres uh, is going to stay two acres until the legislature changes it so the lot size changes would come only for those areas that are development so um, areas out in westport fishhawk lake arch cave miles crossing napa swenson thank you okay you're welcome all right, so I think we left off. Yes, number five. Uh, so right now, uh, number five would be to, again, take multifamily dwellings, mobile home parks, and boarding houses, rooming houses, group housing, and change them from the conditional use to the development permit. So going from the public notice to the development permit and it, that would only affect two zones. It would be the rural community multifamily residential and the rural service there multi, 
area multifamily residential. And that is primarily found in the area of Westport, who is where we have those zones. So um, it would not affect anything down in the Cove Beach, Arch Cape area. And uh, it would only be in those two zones, which already allow those types of uses. And uh, those zones are both multifamily. So any questions or comments about proposed change five? And let's see, okay. Uh, Nancy Chase has asked a question. Can the cluster development standards be modified to support increased housing density as well as open space? The minimum acreage needs to be reduced from four acres. I think the proposed increased housing will become part-time housing for Portlanders and will not help meet the housing need. Have studies been done on price range of affordable housing, either for purchase or rent? Given the price of lots and new construction, is it financially feasible to have prices in an affordable range? So our amendments, um, I don't know the answer, Nancy, to uh, the question about what the affordable price range is uh, for our immediate county. Uh, we do have a housing manager who is doing a lot of work on that affordable and workforce housing side, and we are also participating in that uh, regional housing task force, but I don't know the answer off the top of my head. With regard to the cluster requirements, we actually are in the process of doing some clarification with the state about what we can and cannot do with cluster development. Um, and so, again, I don't know the answer to that. It may be possible, but we are working through the state right now to figure out what, what we can legally do in terms of our density transfers and cluster development. And let's see. So I'm trying to uh, read the chat and give the presentation, and I know Jay's helping out. So um, if you have a question that Jay isn't able to answer and for those of you who don't know, Jay Blake is our planning manager. Um, then just feel free to interrupt me and then we'll move forward. All right, so uh, proposed change number six would be to uh, address the, the single family homes that are in commercial districts. So uh, if you think about uh, in particular, Miles Crossing, Jeffers Gardens comes to mind where we have zoned a lot of the property for commercial and there uh, are also a lot of homes in that area that are in the commercial zones. And these homes were built 100 years ago, 80 years ago. But when the county changed the zoning and made it commercial, we, we basically made those houses non-conforming uses. And if you're a non-conforming use, it means at one point you were legally allowed and you know you you did everything the right way, but the county changed something and now your house doesn't meet code anymore. And if you have a non-conforming home in a commercial zone and you want to build a deck, it's a very onerous process. If you want to do an addition, you it's an onerous process. You're going to be a conditional use application, you're going to pay that $1,200 fee, you're going to go out for the public comment, and you're going to have that appeal period, um, all because you bought an older home in a commercial zone, uh, which maybe could have been the only home that you could afford, or maybe you like the location, or maybe the house is a beautiful house and you wanted to save a historic building, but you're, you're being penalized in a way because you, you took, you, you chose to purchase that house. And so what we, um, would uh, suggest to the board is that uh, instead of considering these to be non-conforming uses, uh, instead just formalizing them through a type one permit, which would just be over the counter, basically to validate that they existed and that they can continue to exist without having to go through this conditional use every time that they wanna add a deck or a bathroom or a bedroom to their building. Uh, what we would not recommend is to just open up the commercial districts to all sorts of new single family homes, because we do have a very limited supply of commercial land. And uh, we do want to be able to protect that and balance our economic development needs with the need for housing. So legitimize and make it easier for the, the people who have the existing homes, but not to allow new single family homes in our commercial districts. 
So any questions about number six? Okay. So um, number seven kind of ties into proposed number six, which is in commercial zones um, to look at allowing multifamily dwellings and manufactured home parks and boarding houses, which are more intense and dense developments, but allowing them as a conditional use in commercial districts. And so that would uh, provide more opportunities for some of this multifamily housing. Um, and depending on where it's located, you know, put it in closer proximity to possible retail uses, which um, could help support um, the two uses could help support each other. And so, uh, again, we don't have all that much commercial use. I don't know how um, we don't have all that much commercial commercial land. So again, making it a conditional use so that we have additional review over it and can uh, place appropriate conditions of approval on it as needed. Uh, any comments or questions about number seven? Uh, number eight uh, is meant uh, to address some of the concerns that we hear many times from employers that their employees can't find housing. And so uh, one suggestion to that staff has put before the board it would be to allow uh, on-site employee housing as a type one use if you've got a commercial um, business established on a parcel and you need to house your employees. So that would be that change. Uh, any questions about that one? Um, and then uh, proposed change number nine, It's this will seem like it's splitting very fine hairs um, with proposal number eight and what we'll look at, I believe is proposed change number 10. Uh, but Right now, if you are in a commercial zone and you've got, uh, you wanna do residential, just as not employee housing, but just general residential, you have to go through a conditional use uh, process and you have to have that commercial use established or built in conjunction with your housing. And so um, again, we would like to keep the commercial use as a type two uh, and then, as an add-on, somebody, a developer would have the option to add that residential component, but do it as a type one use um, so that it's a little bit less onerous and perhaps a bit more encouraging to someone who you know, may be building a, a retail space, but then you know, thinks about putting some residential in the back of it on, on the second floor, but looks at that conditional use and says, maybe not. Um, so again, to, to put out an option to help encourage uh, residential development. Any questions about number nine? Okay, um, let's see. So number 10, uh, this is something that we've already started doing here in the department is that we've refined our applications and the process that we use to review the partitions and we've really cut down the, um, the time to get approvals for a partition. We've gone more to a form checklist because what we're checking with a partition is, do the lots meet the minimum lot sizes? Do they meet the minimum lot widths? Do they have the appropriate lot depths? And so it's a very objective list of standards that we're looking at. And so it's gone more from a formal uh, several paragraphs, several page report to a, a form that basically says, these are your requirements. Do you meet them or not? Um, as part of that, we still have to, under state statute, give the required 10-day public notice. There's still a 12-day appeal period for that, but we've really shortened that processing time down uh, from several months to probably, I would say, about four weeks, uh, maybe a little bit less. Um, in conjunction with that, then uh, what staff would be talking to the board about as well on a separate track would be reducing that partition fee then, uh, because 
the amount of staff time involved with it would all has been reduced and uh, we don't need that thousand dollar fee necessarily to cover what now takes half the time. And so that would be something that we would also look at not only partition fees, but all of our applications and how we can streamline them and maybe reduce some of the fees associated with them. So any questions about number 10? All right, and then 11 is not so much a change. Uh, at this time, uh, the State Department of Land Conservation and Development has selected Clatsop County to participate in this mass timber code up project. And what DLCD is going to be doing is looking at the county's codes to see if there are ways that we can accommodate the more use of mass timber into our housing developments and to, to see if there's any barriers in the code that would prevent mass timber from being used to construct housing. Uh, the work is just starting. We kicked off in February. The state's consultants are now reviewing our codes. And then I think probably around May, there will uh, be some feedback from the consultants uh, with a final report due, I believe, in August of this year. So 11 is not so much a change as it is a wait and see. So any questions about number 11? Gail? Um, maybe yeah. You could, could maybe you could explain a little bit what mass timber is. Not everybody might know that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thanks, Cameron. Yeah. So mass timber, and I'm probably going to explain it long, wrong, but it's basically a product that um, glues together layers of wood pieces uh, to create um, what is a, a pretty strong building material, and it is used in other places in other countries um, and in other places across the country to to build um, multi-story buildings so it's a very strong and dense product and i know this is commissioner thompson's favorite subject and i see her hand so please take the floor commissioner thank you you know what um it's just it's been such an opportunity cameron i really appreciate you asked that question it's, it's value added by further processing forestry products. What Gail is talking about in terms of layers is mass plywood panels. So what we're looking at doing is using every tree that we cut more efficiently, more effectively, which is better for the environment, and then adding value, which is better for uh, Oregon businesses and our tax base, to produce housing, which is better for everybody. So there's a couple of different kinds that we think of. One is the mass plywood panels that are just like you would think of plywood panels that can be relatively you know, thin, a, an inch and a quarter perhaps, up to 24 inches square to make beams. Or there's a, a different kind, which is um, CLT, um, which is, basically more specialized and uh, done for spec housing, but mass plywood panels are really, uh, can be used to create more affordable housing, we hope. Thanks for letting me uh, wave my flag for that one. Hey, thank you, Commissioner Thompson. I appreciate that. And I think if you go down in Eugene, the farmer's market they built was done with mass timber and it's a very beautiful building inside, so. All right, so those were the changes. So to kind of give everyone an idea of uh, some of the other things that we're looking at that you know are gonna be on a different path forward because they will take different levels of time to complete. Uh, we know that uh, in our resource zones, our farm and forest zones, uh, Oregon revised statutes very specifically spell out types of housing that are allowed in those zones. And it very specifically spells out the type of process that you have to use as a jurisdiction to approve it. You can be more stringent and have a higher use um, or a higher level of review, um, but you can't go lower than what is outlined in state statute. So we would want to go through uh, ORS 215 to see if there are areas where maybe we've classified something 
uh, under a more stringent review process, and there may be an opportunity to just revert to what state statute requires. Uh, we also want to take a look at uh, our geologic hazard requirements, and we're doing a little bit of that work now just to see what other jurisdictions do and the requirements they have. Uh, right now, as the county, we require a geologic hazard report for almost everything that uh, goes on. We have a few exceptions that the board adopted um, in the middle of 2023. But for the most part, a lot of things still require a geologic hazard report. Um, and so that can also be um, very expensive and costly and time consuming because expensive and costly are two different things, but it's also time consuming. And uh, we have very few professionals in this area. So that, you know, it's just another layer that adds on time and money. And then again, House Bill 3197, which was adopted in uh, the 23 legislative session will require the county to adopt clear and objective standards standards for housing by July 1st of 2025. Clear and objective standards have already been required for uh, areas within urban growth boundaries. And now that is being uh, expanded to include rural residential lands, unincorporated communities and non-resource lands. Uh, so we are working through that process as well. Because it's a, an established procedure, there's not a rulemaking that's going to be coming out as far as I'm aware or as I understand it, because the cities have already been through this process and it's going to be the same basic thing for the unincorporated areas. Any questions about any of that? Okay, so then in terms of next steps, um, we did an initial work session with the board on October 4th of last year and presented these same 11 uh, ideas to them. Uh, the board, you know, basically said, okay, that sounds good so far. And we uh, took some time to get a public meeting scheduled because of the holidays. And as we learned last night, because of weather and internet issues, uh, but what we will do after today is we will be going back to the board at a work session uh, that has not been scheduled yet. But uh, I know that we've received some written comments and uh, any other comments that we receive either tonight during our meeting or anything after that would go as part of that package over to the board for the work session. And then the board would review that and then give additional direction back to staff. And that could be either, you know, everything seems to be okay, go forward and start the public hearing process or go back and refine these pieces over here, or uh, could even be, well, we decided that none of the works go back to the drawing board and come back again with a completely new set of options. So the board sets the policies and so they will give the direction to staff, but the board is really committed to doing all that they can to help facilitate housing construction. And so um, as staff, we're just trying to give them as many options that are possible. Uh, and it's up to the board to you know, listen to the public input and make the policy decision about what is the path that the county should follow. And I think, I think that's it, that's it. Um, and Commissioner Thompson, I apologize because I did not give you an opportunity at the beginning of the meeting to speak. So um, I'll stop now, but if you would like to say a few words and then we can just go to comments and questions. Oh, I'm, I'm really mostly here to listen. I couldn't contain my excitement when you started talking about mass timber technology, but otherwise just mostly listening. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And let's see, I don't think we have any other board members on tonight. So thank you everyone for listening to me talk for a very long time. Um, please, I just want to sit and listen now as well. So um, if anybody has any questions or comments. Uh, Chris Farrar. Uh, yeah, I, I'm wondering what is going to be the measure of success here? Is as the county, uh, either the board or uh, department, the the community development department, have in their mind what increase in the number of housing units built in un unincorporated areas of of our county? Per year would 
would show that we we made a difference by making changes that you uh, reviewed earlier. Has anybody thought about that? Or are we waiting on data to figure out what what can we expect to get out of this in in actual numbers of housing units? Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome, Chris. That is a very good question. And uh, it's actually a question staff has raised with the state regarding the Oregon housing needs analysis. You know, the housing needs analysis is going to be setting quotas for various jurisdictions, and they're going to have an accountability office that will follow up with these jurisdictions if they don't meet their requirements. Uh, but as I pointed out at the beginning of my presentation, uh, there are so many variables that affect housing construction. And most of them are out of the control of community development and the county. Uh, so we have not, as staff, had this discussion in the, with the board to see what their vision of success would look like, uh, but that is something that we would need to do in the future. And then um, next up is Cameron. There we go, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, um, I had a couple of comments mainly. Um, the biggest question here, the, the uh, very large pink elephant in the room and, and our opinion is that short-term rentals are not being discussed as a part of uh, these housing proposals. There's nothing in any of these proposals, even if they were all enacted um, as is, that would prohibit uh, any of the new housing from becoming short-term rentals unless state law otherwise prohibits it like uh, they do for ADUs, but generally that is not the case. Uh, and it, so it feels to us like it's really jumping the gun for the county to go ahead with proposals like this without uh, setting a strong cap or other type of restriction on short-term rentals because you haven't, uh, you're just proposing to increase housing without um, uh, channeling it into the direction where it needs to go. Uh, so that was the first comment I wanted to make. And the second one is, uh, people are tossing around a lot the governor's um, a term or, or her number that uh, we need to build 36,000 units of housing uh, a year for 10 years. That's not a data-driven number. It's not a determined number. Uh, it, and I hear people talking about it as if it had been handed down from heaven as the number that we need to meet statewide. Uh, and I would caution the county as well as the state um, against doing that uh, until we know better uh, what kind of housing is needed, it, it, where, uh, where it should be concentrated. Uh, and then the third thing I wanted to mention is that many of the proposals here uh, seek to reduce um, uh, application fees by uh, limiting or eliminating uh, public involvement. And type one applications are not only do not require public notice, but they don't have an opportunity for public comment and there's no opportunity for public appeal uh, or local appeal or any kind of appeal. So basically you are removing people's ability to uh, have a say in the future livability of their communities. And uh, we're concerned about that for uh, a lot of these proposals because these could make uh, really in a large way change the face of uh, local unincorporated communities in uh, in the county and would urge you to be parsimonious to say the least with uh, the amount of reduction of public involvement that you have. Let's, let's all remember that goal one of the land use laws is citizen involvement. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Cameron. Uh, next is Marks. Hi. Um, hey, first of all, I think you've done a really nice job tonight. Uh, thank you. You know, um, there's a number of people on this call that have a lot more understanding of all this than some of us do. And I think you've really helped us understand this. Um, I just had a couple of comments about or questions about Arch Cape. Because, um, you know, just in receiving the documents that I've received, and I live in Arch Cape, my wife and I live in Arch Cape, um, it just... It seems it just initially seemed like we were being targeted for development, and I don't know that that's the case or not the case. Maybe just that the residential 
community thing is changing a little bit. Um, but because there's a lot of, we're a long way from anything that's commercial or, you know, it's a long way to a gas station or anything else. And so I don't know how much development this is going to spur in Arch Cape. And you don't either probably, but I wouldn't mind you commenting on that. And then also there was a question earlier that I'm not sure was clearly answered about the Arch Cape water and sewer, because it seems that we're a bit challenged on that. So thank you. And thank you again for all your, your clarity in tonight. Your presentation was really nice. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, so to go back and answer the first question, the the changes in the development areas in the rural communities would go across the five rural communities. So Arch Cape uh, up to Miles Car Crossing Jeffers Gardens, which is that area uh, it's kind of south of Astoria and east of Warrington. And then over on the east side of the county, Napa, Swenson area off of Highway 30, and then Westport at the very east end of the county on Highway 30. So it, it was, the changes are not proposed um, to apply to any one specific zone or one particular area of the county. Um, so that's that one. I don't know how much development it will spur and again, there's just so many variables that affect how and where and when housing gets constructed. And a lot of them, even if you open the codes up, um, it's really up to the market to start driving it and the affordable housing developers to, to make those decisions. So anyway, thank you for your comments and questions. Thank you for your answer. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other questions, comments? Okay, well, seeing none. Uh, oh, I know you had a question about. I'm sorry, Marks, about the Arch Cape uh, water sewer, and I don't. I don't know what the question was. I'm live. Okay. I think what, it was. Um, it was a, yeah, impact study. You know, are you, are you going to do it? Uh, is there an impact study that's being done? How it's going to impact our water sewer if you increase the number if if you increase the number of uh, how much can be built and and we're kind of you know at a point where i don't know if we can sustain that are you doing a study to confirm before you do any of that lot changing so what will happen is under oregon administrative rules if if the board wants staff to move forward with these changes or some of them. Um, we have to give notice to the public utility districts. There's a requirement to do that. At, I believe it's 45 days before the, the first hearing. Additionally, every time a dwelling gets built in the county, there has to be a sign off by uh, the fire district, the water district, if there is one, or the water master, if it's a well and by the sewer district or the septic uh, sign off at environmental health. And those water and sewer sign offs um, have to verify that the, the district has capacity to serve the new, the new house. So we do not, because water and utility districts are their own entities. They are not part of the county. They are their own special governments and they have their own boards and they are completely separate from the county. But um, so we we are not tracking their water usage or their operations or anything like that. Um, but it is up to them to track their capacity. And then if an application comes to them and they don't have the capacity, they should not be signing the development approval form. Will, will you try and determine that capacity before you make these attempt to make changes? Because if you go ahead and change it to type one and then all these other things can occur and it, we're going it, is it that is that the way it works? I'm not familiar with the process, but I'd want to have that impact study done and and have those answers prior to make these cha making these changes. Yeah, so again, the, the, the county doesn't track the capacity of the water districts or the sewer districts. That's the role of those districts because they are their own independent governments. That would be like me going into Astoria and saying, I'm going to audit your water system. I don't have the jurisdiction to do that. The water districts and the sewer districts, if we do any of these changes, are required 
to have a notice from the county so that they can provide comment on the proposed changes. And it's at that point that if a jurisdiction comes forward and says, we don't have capacity or we get, only have capacity to serve 100 you know, additional accounts before we have to expand our plants, you know, that's the comment they need to give back to us. But we as the county don't go in and assess another jurisdiction's capacity. Thank you. That that explained it for me. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Director Henderson, Nadia Gardner here. Um, hey, Nadia. Hi. You, um, so the, the county doesn't have jurisdiction, certainly, over our special districts, like the Archcape Water District and um, Sanitary District, as well as the Sheriff. Well, you have some, you're over the Sheriff, but the, um, the Cannon Beach Fire District. But you do have responsibility over all these rural communities infrastructure or um you know our roads to some extent of course public private county have different um, responsibilities and and other aspects of these communities so you know has there been any analysis around like you know if we double the amount of lots east of the highway in arch cape which is what could potentially happen like there'll be long-term consequences on the infrastructure that the county or landowners will we be responsible for it it feels to me like as it is the county has limited interest in supporting our infrastructure um like you know what kind of thought process is happening currently around you know that long-term responsibility we're not a city um, we're unincorporated communities that that the county does have some responsibility for. So I'd like to understand how you're sharing the long-term um, responsibilities and expenses that the county will incur as a result of especially this increased density. Okay, so the just so everyone has the same knowledge base here. So uh, when Nadia talks about the different types of roadways in the county, uh, we have county maintained roadways. So things like Lewis and Clark uh, is a county maintained roadway. I believe Logan Road is a uh, county contained roadway. Public roads are not maintained by the county, even though they are opened up to the public and everybody can use them, but the county does not maintain them. And then finally, there are private roads, um, which in newer uh, partitions, we have a thing called a road maintenance agreement that spells out the cost sharing between the private property owners and how they're gonna handle maintenance of the road. I mean, there are a couple of different options, potentially, I mean, it may not be the, the most exciting options that you're looking for, but I mean, roads could potentially, for the county to take over maintenance of a road, it would have to be brought up to, to county standards. And that's, um, going to be a big cost because it's going to be uh, probably paving, it's probably going to be additional right of way and things like that. And so that's really not a realistic option, uh, particularly probably in Arch Cape. Um, the, the question is probably better directed towards public works. And I apologize, I didn't anticipate a public works question um coming out of uh tonight's meeting but i i guess i what i'm saying is i don't have the full answer in terms of how those costs there are options i guess uh, uh limited improvement districts where uh property owners could be assessed um i guess there are probably other options but nadia i don't have the full uh well, set of facts to of answer course. that question before your time, Director Hendrickson, we went through an entire process to work through whether we wanted to do these different things, whether we wanted to incorporate, when we wanted to do local, um, a local um, uh, initiative like you discussed. But we decided as a community instead to raise our short-term rental fees so that the county would help us take care of these things. And that didn't happen. So it's not, you know, it, it, there are some responsibilities currently and you know, in recent years, thanks largely to the advocacy of Commissioner T Thompson, thank you, um, where the county has come in and helped uh, help support some of that public infrastructure. And I think that should con continue. And, um, you know, I, I, I think there are economic consequences to increasing density like this. I'm fully supportive of affordable housing for our locals. Um, for our, especially for our workers and our families. Um, but 
you know, to put through this kind of a higher density housing is expensive in the long term, both for a residents and for the county. And I don't see it actually getting us that affordable housing that, you know, you're proponing, you're saying that it will get us. And, um, you know, it's pretty frustrating, I think, for me and others in the room that there's this idea that that it will. And um, of course, there's a focus on short term rentals. But the reality is, you know, Arch Cape has is expensive. The house behind me, I'm east of the highway in the woods, no, no view of the ocean just sold for seven forty five. That is not an affordable housing for a, res a, a worker or a family anymore. And so I, I don't understand why this is being put under this housing initiative, the all price points um, focus doesn't make any sense from a, um, you know, from a logical standpoint, it really feels to me that it's just a, an interest in increasing development um, and, and enriching the rich rather than providing the people who really need housing, housing. Okay. Thank you, Nadia. Commissioner Thompson. Thank you, Nadia. Thanks for taking my name in uh, such high praise. I appreciate it. Yeah, the county has been involved. You know, the county ponied up a quarter of a million dollars to help purchase the Arch Cape Forest to maintain the the watershed protection and to maintain that whole idea of the of the natural spaces. What we're talking about tonight is just part of a whole range of interrelated complex parts. I'm reminded of when I go into the garage and my grandpa would have taken something apart and all these pieces were on the floor. And if I looked at one piece or another piece or another piece, I couldn't see the whole of it. The county's been talking about a lot of the different pieces, too many for us to go into tonight. I really appreciate your raising concerns about the infrastructure. When I've been talking with Terry Hendricks, who's um, the new public works director, and, and I don't know enough to describe his whole response you know the we'll get him in here to talk about the whole range of the picture but what i took away from this is there are generational issues because the development has been incremental and the development didn't include adequate ditches and drainage systems it's a really big issue it's a really expensive problem and one of the reasons the county's been encouraging our Arch Cape neighbors, my neighbors, my neighborhood, to look at incorporation is because if we organize ourselves to focus specifically on what our issues are, and we have some kind of organizational structure, we can then apply for the federal grants that may help us deal with these, with these I want to call them hereditary generational infrastructure issues that haven't been addressed. All I can tell you is, you know, we care about it. The county cares about it. We want to do the best level of service we can for everybody in all of the unincorporated areas. And we want to help each particular neighborhood do as much as it can for itself to most effectively meet the, na the needs of its own neighborhood. Inside of that, well, sorry, outside of that bigger nest of bowls, we have state mandates. And somebody can say, oh, the governor proposes it doesn't mean it's going to happen. Well, that's the governor of the state of Oregon. So there's a pretty good impetus toward 36,000 housing units for 10 years because people see all over Oregon, we've got housing issues. What we're trying to do is to get the most specific and effective adaptations that will allow us to have that compassionate neighborly sense and develop the options that will meet the need of everybody. It's not going to be easy. I mean, ADUs may be a part of it. They may help people be able to afford some housing. The trends are not with us. They're pretty scary trends. Yes, yes. Over seven hundred dollars for a lot without an ocean view—that's that's scary to hear about. We can't stop that from happening. We can look at everything. We are looking at everything. So rest assured, when you raise an issue that you've raised before, 
it hasn't gone away. We're not ignoring it. It's just part of the array of pieces that are right now on the garage floor waiting to be reassembled. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Thompson. All right. Are there any other comments or questions right now for this evening? Okay, so seeing none, um, I have posted. Hey, I, don't, um, I don't know how to raise my hand. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, uh, you caught me off guard. You talked there. about the mass timber. I know there are way more issues that are more pertinent, but the mass timber industry, you got to realize it's already well entrenched into the construction world in Clatsop County in the form of LVLs and BCIs. It's engineers are using it all the time in the construction world right now. The sad thing about it is those products are more expensive than dimensional cut lumber at the at the moment. That, I know there's more issues in, that are way more important, but I do have knowledge about the mass timber that you talked about. May I, may I just add, Bob, of course you're right on this. It's not for single family. The economies of scale that accrue for um, multifamily units can help offset that. And that's what we've been aiming at and looking for. That's part of all this, but I'm glad to hear you weigh in. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments or questions this evening? Um, yes, let me ask, you uh, mentioned that this is recorded. Is there a way that I can review this uh, rather new resident, but I would like to review the entire uh, process and the comments made is there a way that I can do that? So after today's yeah. meeting or tonight's meeting, um, I, tomorrow I'll post the video. It's on the county's website on the calendar page where our meeting agenda was for today and the Zoom link. I've also already posted the presentation slides from tonight's meeting. So those are already up there and a fact sheet that uh, public affairs put together. So the video will be posted tomorrow morning and it'll be uh, available for everyone to look at and listen to. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Jess, you had a question? Um, yeah, there was talk of a um, a project in Arch Cape. I don't remember where it was located that had to do specifically with affordable housing. Does that ring a bell? And and if so, do you know the status of that? I don't want to hijack this if this is not the right time to talk about that, but I just want to know the status of that. Yeah, so um, the project was proposed, I believe, maybe almost a year ago now, and it was on the east side of Arch Cape on some property that the county owns. And based upon uh, input that the board received, the county manager's office and the housing manager worked to um, develop a process for reviewing applications like that. Uh, but also more importantly, they went through the surplus property list and uh, did some uh, additional analysis on many of the properties and then rank them. And so the Arch Cape property uh, has moved very low on the list right now because there are um, constraints regarding infrastructure like the roads and um, also the, um, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought here, uh, slopes, I think were another uh, issue that were of concern. So, um, I have not heard anything more from that particular uh, developer who was proposed that project, but I do know that in the ranking of the surplus property uh, that that moved down. And I think that was something that the board actually reviewed um, a few months ago was that new ranking. So did that answer your question, Jess? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh -huh. You're welcome. Okay, so. Um, I think we, we are over our time, but I appreciate the comments and the questions. And again, the presentation is posted on the website and I will have the video up tomorrow. And then once we know when the um, second work session with the board is scheduled, then there will be a public notice put out about that through our communications department. So thank you everyone for your time and uh, for coming back again this evening. I really appreciate you uh, staying with us through the technical difficulties yesterday and enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye. Thank you.